All right, next video, talking about three more ascending sensory tracts in the spinal cord. Um, these three all have a little bit in common, um, but they're a little bit more uh, unique than the last one. The first one we're going to be talking about is the anterior spinal cerebellar. Next one we're going to be talking about is the posterior spinal cerebellar and I've got a couple different ways that I remember those two um, after that up near the top is the cuneo cerebellar anterior spinal cerebellar let's talk about where it is right about here outside so make sure you find that it's on page 75 of the notes um, posterior spinal cerebellar make sure you find that one sitting in the just a little bit more posterior there now we know the spinal, the cerebellum deals with coordinating muscle movements. So we know right off the bat that these are not going to have anything to do with pain, with touch, with anything like that because they're going to the cerebellum. The cerebellum doesn't care what you're feeling, it just cares that things work. The anterior spinal cerebellum, spinal cerebellar tracts, has a couple things that are a little bit vague about it. Um, we'll talk about what it does after we draw it because it's really easy to remember after that. First of all, the cell bud is on the outside. It comes in here. There's a little synapse. This synapse is in the gray matter. We don't know where. It could be anywhere in an, in one of the ten rexid lamina. It's very, very general. So right here, the synapse is in the gray. We don't care where it is. That's where the synapse is. The other thing we need to remember is that the anterior spinal cerebellar cere cerebellar tract has lumbosacral origins so probably dealing with walking is what we're looking at here it doesn't care what your neck does it doesn't care what your fingers do it's dealing in the lumbar and the sacral region it's only got two neurons in its full path all three of these only have two neurons in the path in the path so we're going to follow this one. It crosses over immediately, comes up the other side, but now we've seen it cross once, but we know the cerebellum deals with, uh, has ipsilateral symptoms, so we know it's got to get back over somehow. Then sitting right here, we've got the peduncle, the superior cerebellar peduncle. And I just think of peduncles as little doorways. So you've got an upper doorway, a middle doorway, and an inferior doorway. The anterior, that's the path it takes. It goes through that. We'll draw that in a different color. I like things to be organized. It's pretty obvious. All right, so then we come down, passes through the superior cerebellar peduncle, comes over into the cerebellum, crosses back over the inside of the spinal cord, and it synapses in the cerebellum. Remember, it's a spinal cerebellum, therefore it's synapsing in the spinal cerebellar cerebellum uh, functional division of the cerebellum. But we're just going to draw it wherever. Now look at the shape that this makes. This little red line here. It makes a four. It makes now what that helps us remember is the function of the anterior spinal cerebellum it deals with future movements so it doesn't care what has happened it's looking at what is going to happen so it's dealing with forward thinking of gross motor movement so we've got the number four here as the tract because the anterior spinal cerebellar deals with forward thinking of gross movements and that's its function. Now if we've got something telling us what the gross movements are of what is going to happen, we've got to have something else telling us what did happen. Now we've got the posterior spinal cerebellum. It's a little bit confusing that it has three ways for it to come in. Let's first deal with 
the easiest one, or two ways I should say, that the spinal cerebellum can get up into the cerebellum. First, anything coming in between C8 and L3 is going to just be a very, very normal, plain, posterior spinal cerebellar tract. Comes in, cell body on the outside, quick synapse. Same as the anterior spinal cerebellum, except this one is synapsing on the nucleus dorsalis. You go back to page 64, 65, you're going to see that that is Clark's nucleus, or Rexid lamina 7. And that's where that first synapse is. That's the little garage that it stops in. From there, it's got to continue its way up. So a little synapse does not cross. The posterior spinal cerebellum does not cross. All it does is come up, comes through the inferior peduncle. We just dealt with that, dealing with the, the cerebellum. It stops right there. So it's real plain. Two neurons in the pathway. Um, the tracked part of it is this second. Same with the anterior. This is also the tracked portion of this pathway. Now, remember the posterior spinal cerebellum? It deals with move, fine movements that have just happened. You remember that? Because when a girl walks by you, or in my case, my wife walks by me, what do you see? You see their posterior. You see their butt. You think, man, that is fine. So they got a fine posterior. And it just happened because they just walked by. That's how you remember the posterior spinal cerebellum deals with fine movements that just happened as opposed to forward thinking. <coughs> you got a fine posterior that just walked by. And that's how you remember. Now anything below L3, we still need some way to collect information from below L3 about fine motor movements. In that case, you've got the grossless. The grossless just acts as a little as a little carrier. So grass is down here, it's green like grass. It comes up, it's going to keep going, but then there's a little branch, synapse is on. So anything dealing with uh, fine movement that just happened, hitches onto the grossless because it's a nice guy. It comes up in the grossless and then it jumps off at this little garage, dorsalis garage, the nucleus dorsalis or Clark's garage in the gray matter, the Rexid lamina 7. Go back to page 64, 65 if you need to review that real quick. But that's where anything dealing with fine movement that just happened that was below L3 comes on the grassless, stops there. From that point, it's exactly the same. After it's hitchhiked to ride in the grassless, it comes up the regular posterior spinal cerebellar, doesn't cross, enters the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now, I'm going to, then I won't erase it. Now next, we have the cuneo cere cerebellar tract. And that one has the exact same function as the posterior spinal cerebellar, so it's fine movement, what just happened. It's a little team, but it's, it only does everything above C8. So it takes stuff, information from the shoulder girdle and the pec girdle. Um, so anything up here, it does the same thing. Cell bodies in the outside comes in. This is where it's a little different. It comes up and then there's a little synapse right here. And there's a little synapse on, let me get the right color here. There's a little synapse on the accessory cuneate nucleus. So this cuneo cerebellum cuneocerebellar tract is everything from above C8 dealing with fine movement that just happened comes up synapses on the accessory cuneate nucleus which is in the medulla oblongata and then comes back down through the inferior peduncle inferior cerebellar peduncle and just the same as the anterior and posterior spinal cerebellum spinal cerebellar tracts it's going to go to the spinocerebellar lobe of the cerebellum. That's real hard to say fast. Try saying all those words a few more times 
I've had to stop and retry this video 20 times. No, I actually haven't, but I probably should have. So those are those three tracks. All of them are ascending sensory tracks. They all have two neurons. The second neuron in each of the pathways is considered the tracked neuron. Um, I think that's about it. Anything more detail will be in your notes or in the chart that Dan gave us, which are awesome. Um, other than that, draw this out a couple times. Remember the four. Remember the girl walking by you. And you'll remember the rest pretty easily. And that's those three tracks.